we're starting. Hey, everybody, how you doing? This is Tim Jasmine here for another episode of Friends Talking Nerdy. And, of course, we have the holiest of holies. We have the Reverend Tracy. How are you doing? I'm doing splendiferous. How are you doing? Splendiferous. All right. Uh, what was that? The guy who was the mayor of Imagination Land said that? I am doing oh. splendiferous, sir. Somebody that said actually that. Actually, may be true. I'm not sure. I just wanted to give you something different than the other episode that we did not record just before this. <laughs> Wink. But all right. Um, folks on Patreon, um, if you are hearing this within uh, the, in, in February, um, you are going to hear us talk about four stories about hand stuff. Episode seven from season four of Big Mouth. Now, general impressions. What do you think? Um, overall, I liked this episode. I thought it was good. Uh, it was really funny because I missed this the first watch through. I think I must have fallen asleep. So I was like, wait, four stories about hand jobs. But uh, I, I liked it. Um, there was a little bit of Matthew being a snot again for a minute that I didn't super appreciate. But overall, mostly positive things. Um, I actually am even glad some of the topics they covered and how they covered them. So I'm... A lot of good stuff, not super a lot of bad stuff, just a few things. And some of the bad stuff was really just, well, that made me cringe. Yeah. <laughs> so not really bad, just cringeworthy almost. But what about you? Well, it's, it's weird. I mean, is it bad in regards – do I think it's bad in regards to the next star episode? No, this is a major improvement. Um, but in a lot of ways, this episode – and there's one further episode near the end of the season um, – <clears throat> really felt like filler. It didn't. It, it felt like the main storylines they were trying to touch upon this season were essentially kind of put on hold, apart from, um, apart from the Jesse storyline. It it just seemed like we it was going along. Um, having said that, there were a lot of good things that did occur that you know will will come to fruition in later seasons. But I, I'm not going to say that this episode was bad. But I will say for me, it was really uneven and just hit or miss at best. But um, um, yeah, I mean, one thing it did, one thing I liked in terms of, I mean, if we're going to start off talking about the positive stuff, one thing I liked that was an immediate improvement over the previous episode, we start off with Maury and Connie. Yes, I loved that. I actually, I really like uh, that the hormone monsters start off by kind of breaking the wall. Like, those tend to be really good episodes when they're just kind of talking to the audience mm -hmm. and kind of calling out how fucking weird the last episode was, like, from the go. It's totally like kind agreed. of made up for it. They, yeah, I mean, they, they agreed with us. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, we realized that was kind of fucking weird. But, you know, we did it, and here we are, and we're back. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, which uh, brought us into the episode proper. Um, but in, in this episode is not a traditional story. It's kind of... Uh, um, you know, it, it like it, it's a play off of what the Simpsons did with uh, 22 and a half short stories in Springfield or something. The episode where you had like a bunch of characters having like a one minute story, like Cletus the slack jawed yokel. Um, you know, what was that line? You know, hey, uh, uh, you might could wear these to your job interview. What? Sc scuff up the topless dance in one way? Nah, you best bring them back where from you got them. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, you go I, to waste for a woman, a less discriminating taste. Love that line. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, no, I was just going to say, I totally agree. They they totally did a different format. Uh, usually they kind of do that very standard of they're going to hop from story to story. You know, it, it's to be fair, it's a formula that's worked for a very long time with shows that does work for most of their shows. But mm -hmm. this time there was really no need to, like, make different sections because each story just flowed in a row instead of jumping back and forth, which I appreciated for the storytelling they were doing in this episode. It worked really well, and mm -hmm. it made it where you didn't miss the characters when it was done because you kind of got that little piece of the story was done for now right the caleb cameo i i loved that at the beginning when he uh served the divorce papers to Devin. you know when when uh, devon said you know how does she take it with her right hand <laughs> yes yes and i love Devin being served by caleb and just how that so represents that will you break up with them for me that like most of us can totally relate to um I, and I'm really starting to appreciate the authenticity of Caleb's character because that is so, like, dead on. And it goes back to other moments I've loved where he was, like, pointing at the face chart, like, while he's trying to learn how to read emotions. And angry. he goes, angry. <laughs> she is angry. <laughs> like, it takes you right back to that. I love Caleb. I don't think they overuse him. And it was 
really chuckled like with her right hand just amazing i loved it just he lands jokes he he does i mean similar to, it's it's somewhat similar to what they do with uh drax and the guardians of the galaxy films but um what what what's something else that stuck out to you as a positive oh gosh um <clears throat> the conversation with the girls in the locker room around the pressure of doing things you may not want to to keep somebody like uh you know i'm just kind of glad that it's out there you know it's not so much that it was a positive thing it's just like a realization of like yeah there is that pressure that we actually give each other in our own social groups and that was actually a little bit of a theme like throughout this it kind of showed that it's not just pressure from like the boyfriend or the girlfriend like trying to get you to do something a lot of times it comes from your friends and things that they are saying um, I loved Lola's head exploding at being told the idea that maybe it could also be the man's job to please the woman. Oh, I love her in that scene, though, overall. Like, you know, she sees uh, Caleb give the divorce thing, and then she goes into the locker room. She's doing backflips, throwing sparkles, talking about how much of a tragedy <laughs> it is that the divorce is happening. And and that, oh, that was so great. And and to your point, too, uh, the discussion among the girls. Um, at, I liked it. However, I felt that um, the dialogue was a little too adult, um, per se. It, it didn't seem genuine that kids would be talking like this. And, and they do have... It's not the first time I've noticed that, like the like the storyline where Lola was talking about being six months old and Jay, uh, just a concern that I don't think a 13-year-old girl would have. Um, yeah. You know, how they, they had the conversation in the locker room, I don't think necessarily a 13 year old girl um would, would want to talk like that but i think they do talk you know i mean sex is very much happening in in uh, middle school area so i think they very much talk now as to if they're getting good information or not it's a different story you know and obviously with the lola example they were not getting some in good information in some cases well i mean i can speak to some of that talk happening at around that age mm. uh I, and I can't say that's every person's experience in the in like around the girls like as they were growing up. But no, I kind of remember like because they're at kind of thirteen, right? Yeah. Twelve, thirteen, I think is kind of their age group. Um, because I forget because I know they've been aging each year. So I was trying to remember what grade they were going into. But uh, yeah. So that part I actually found more believable than what we get into after this, which is the low J part of this which surprised me because as much as i don't like them i really loved them in this episode yeah um they it was a pleasant surprise i loved their conversation and i do dig that jay seems to be very good giving in game at this point and i even put a note like in here is albeit inappropriate for his age but we do need to kind of remember this is ultimately a cartoon for adults um, even their conversation about how the fingering was going down pleasantly surprised me. Um, but again, like, do I see 13 year olds actually being able to have like a conversation like where she could guide him through something like that and that going successful at that age? Heck no. This I felt like this episode was really more about getting certain messages to an adult demographic than it was about actually covering stuff that actually happens in puberty. Yeah. And, and I, I think when it came to that message too i think it it made me think that you know because one note i had was talking about uh the conversation jay had with uh, nick and andrew and you know i i, I think it, for me that kind of brought up the fact that you know and i think you mentioned it too that women are told a lot about male anatomy in terms of pleasure in terms of how it works and whatnot and whereas guys are kind of left on their own <laughs> in, in, in terms of, you know, uh, it's not encouraged to have that conversation of, of, you know, what works, what doesn't, you know, you know, two people that are, that are young, that are getting together will tend to be super nervous and there won't be that conversation sometimes if it's going good, then yeah, the conversation is going to, going to happen. But, you know, a lot of times you're not, guys don't, know to seek out that information because they can also be overconfident as well you know similar to uh the, you know jay always calling himself the ultimate fuck machine and of course doing the typical guy thing of what are you going to do when when you want to ask how to please a woman you of course go to your male friends and ask because that that makes the most logical choice 
Yes, and like some of that reality did come through, like Jay getting defensive and saying, well, I asked the guys how to do it, and I loved the line of Lola pointing out, well, you never talk to any girls, and most specifically me, and that was that level of, yeah, (laughs) of course she said it that way, like... (laughs) The maturity surprises you with these two in this episode. So, but they do tend to have those moments, like, as a couple, like, where they kind of, like, break through and get a little bit mature for each other. This one just seemed to kind of take a leap, mm-hmm. um, where it's like, I, I did, I felt like this was almost outside of their normal storyline, um, with how much more mature they seemed about their relationship. Uh, yeah. I really enjoyed the cartoon interpretation of Jay Zilla and the castle. Like the first time just being like chaotic and super uncomfortable. And like, you've got Lola's comments. And then the second time when she's guiding him through it. And again, you kind of get into that, like what 13 year old is going to know to guide like a, a another, a, another child basically to navigating your body. But I really loved what that story of the four stories, like kind of represented in this whole episode. And, and and for people that haven't seen the episode, keep in mind that, you know, this the, the purpose of this isn't to give instructions to 13 year olds on how to do this necessarily. It's more of encouraging the adults to have this conversation, because the point is, the more people have these conversations, the more comfortable they're going to be overall, especially in cases of intimacy and whatnot. You know, you want if you're with somebody in an intimate situation, you want to be the best possible partner you can be. So it is a very much a good thing to encourage asking to encourage communication because you know there are people guys and girls alike who will just dive into it looking out for themselves and themselves only and you know one person may have fun but you know if you're trying to do something with somebody else everybody's got to be into it you know yeah um Another funny haha that it got me to chuckle really good. Jay's three man operation for getting his nails clipped. That was pretty funny. Um, the hyperbole of acting more like an animal than a child actually would. Uh, <laughs> for some reason, having Nick and Andrew like pin him down and clip his nails was, was, oh, was funny to me. My my youngest Luke is like that. Like um, for the longest time, and I'm you know. I can have a laugh about it now, but um, I, for the longest time, my ex couldn't cut his nails. He would only allow me to do it. If she <laughs> attempted or anybody else attempted to cut his nails, it would be screaming. It would be, you're hurting me. But then I cut his nails. She's like, boom, 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 done. <laughs> you know? um, I know one line I liked. There, It was near the end of the episode. It was, I believe, yeah, it was when Maury talking to Andrew no, no, um, it was a Matt, it was talking to Matthew and it was a morning line. It was, let's just take the pressure off, circle a date on the calendar six months from now, and if you're not ready by then, I'll kill myself. <laughs> <laughs> the smile on his face. Yeah, that was one of, I, I, I didn't like a lot of, well, I guess I liked some of Matthew's story. He, he's, he landed a little bit more in the negatives for me on this one, but I did have a note. Um, Matthew, when he's being honest about his insecurities, is kind of the only time I like him. Like, his fake falls away when he talks to Maury, I've noticed. Uh, and I, I really did kind of like Maury's recap of gay history. That was kind of interesting to watch. Mm. I mean, I will get into that just not now. Um, and, and that's the thing with the Matthews story, and I'm glad you brought that up as well, about somewhat liking him. I don't want to somewhat like him. I mean, I don't have to like everybody on the show. I mean, I, why, you know, why would there be antagonists if you're supposed to like everybody? But we are meant as the audience to like him. We're Obviously, they're flawed. Every character is flawed, but... Yeah. Just Matthew again and again and again just just goes to a level of assholishness that that really keeps me from wanting to connect with him. So even when he has some some moments of regular humanity pop up, I I, I just don't care because you know it's going to go away. Yeah. It, it does seem to feel like that, but then it goes into like, well, he is still a kid, so hopefully he outgrows this at some point, right? Hopefully, and, you know, I mean, the show's not done, of course. It's got a couple more seasons in the books, and if Matthew ends up changing as a character, I will gladly change my opinion at that time because this is a serialized story. So, But um, just for as it stands now, just how th- my perception of Matthew up to this point didn't help me in this episode. Yeah, I, I really did like uh, this 
the Mori, like, right before he uh, goes back in to, like, kind of get really aggressive with Aiden, where he's mm-hmm. like, come on, say it like you want a dick in your hand. <laughs> and then Matthew marching off just being like, okay, dick, like a battle cry <laughs> was was pretty funny. Um, I really did appreciate, like, I like Aiden, and I like how he, you know, brought it down. Um, of course it should be fun. Why else would we do it? And then that really nice bring it down, so it's okay to wait. Of course. Um, played again, by, uh, played by Zachary, uh, Aiden is played by Zachary Quinto, who is Spock in the J.J. Abrams Star Trek movies. I didn't know that. Yep. <laughs> but I, I did like how that relationship, like how, you know, it... <sighs> It is interesting that it's the younger kids that has, like, one of them that seems to have, like, the nice, like, mature level of it that's getting them out of these situations, like, escalating into something bad. So Mm -hmm. I liked seeing it play out that way. And then you get to the part where mom reads the texts, which there's part that you appreciate it because they just had this really awkward conversation. And in a way, it's really beautiful that they're being cute and playful about it and, like, making jokes. Mm -hmm. But woof the messages his mom happens to read and then we'll watch that unfold later because it does not finish unfolding in this episode and they did do a good job with that and in in that particular storyline in later episodes obviously we're going to get to that when when we get to it but um i i I liked her reaction too because i i you know i i think she was she comes off as as a type of person that would have been upset if matthew had you know, pictures of a high school girl on his phone as well. I think she right. she wants her little boy to always be her little boy. <laughs> yes, but they they get more into that family dynamic. I believe it is in the next episode, so I don't mm-hmm. want to do anything too far into it. But it does introduce that there is something about to happen to really shake up Matthew's little world because if you see like a little bit of how his mom treats him is. Uh, uh, yeah, a little bit of the favorite, it seems. So and this is the beginning of that. And it's not, it, it, yeah, I mean, their relationship was not healthy either because they did touch upon it with Matthew's story, um, which was, excuse me, was a positive. The fact that he was convincing himself that his mother already knew he was gay, so he didn't need to tell her. Right. You know, kind of ignoring the signs that, you know, she knew but was trying to pretend. You know, I think they were both trying to tell themselves, um, you know, what was actually happening wasn't happening. So the, I, I did like that part. Yes, that very much because that is so common mm-hmm. um, in those situations. And that's that's all of the positives I had um, with Matthew. I had a couple uh, more, it's just basic lines. There was one line from Andrew, um, John Mulaney, how he delivered it just had me laughing. And it was, oh, please, would a psychopath keep a journal logging every ejaculation by weight and color? And I'm thinking, color? Color? Ew. (laughs) What are you doing to have it be different color? (laughs) Oh, gosh. No, I've I've got some other positives about the Andrew and Nick part of it. Um, But, yeah, Andrew referring to jerking off as self-medicating for Nick's anxiety (laughs) was was kind of funny, like treating it like a medication. Um, Mm -hmm. I loved the feed into Nick and Rick, like reminding us of the grind that pepper advice back from season one and how, like, Nick just did not have have a good experience when he like first tried to masturbate like that was a really solid comeback or callback I mean like I just to give it credit solid callback as much as I hate thinking about that even being a way anybody would attempt to handle a penis like makes me cringe um what but, you gonna do, <laughs> you gotta do? <laughs> exactly but yeah I really loved uh <laughs> the Glauberman method just this overly silly just funny enough to really enjoy just how ridiculous it was and then Nick you interrupted me now I have to do it over again and Nick's general response being like that sounds like how a psychopath would masturbate (laughs) and uh I couldn't like oh my gosh like that to me was pretty funny and then like Nick going like wait a second would you have finished if I had let you and just Andrew like yeah just (laughs) like 
but but they do but they do the editing trick again too to where they don't let a space happen after the yeah it's like after like the moment the word is out of his mouth they immediately cut to the next scene which oh, for me yeah. always increases the humor uh when they do that um there's one other line in that scene that i liked uh it's when maury is talking to andrew about ditching the method and he's like jacking off is supposed to be spontaneous and fun like a motorcycle blowing up in front of a bikini woman and that's right you know it's supposed to be because andrew and his me- i i don't get them I, I i can understand as a kid wanting to double check the lock i get that part <laughs> but uh everything else on the method was just a little ocd and i don't recall them ever really um it, it, exploring any ocd type of issues with andrew before unless i missed it well i mean he does have a lot of stress like around his sexuality so i could totally see that being a way of dealing with anxiety before he is getting comfortable with doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, so in a way, that kind of ritual does make sense. It's a little extreme. Like, I don't think most like people would have something like that. But I, I don't think it's beyond the realm of possibility because the fact that we don't talk about these things allows kids to make up their own rules and almost this like weird spiritual, like it, it's almost done in the same like importance of order of like some kind of sacrifice or ritual right because hey case in point he deters from it and then there's immediately a phone call that his grandpa died and then these anxitos start showing up and convince him that because he deterred from the method that he kills his grandfather and i can like yeah like i i I i'm trying to think of an example of where somebody's like oh yeah i did this thing that had nothing to do with it because that was bad like somebody died like i i feel like that's more something that i got um from religion like in churches like the the idea that you do bad things and something like really bad can happen um and and that's where i related to it like the whole every time you masturbate god kills a kitten thing so there's like this guilt around like sexual pleasure and then something bad happening but yeah not not around a ritual like that happening before it (laughs) yeah i i I don't know and and a lot of times too i mean as we pointed out on this show they will take a, a normal situation and essentially make it a little more extreme because th- th- with comedy the jokes a lot of times comes from the exaggerations um like the you know the hugest period ever episode two um you know realistically there's not going to be any sort of pad that would soak up an entire lake or pull a plane out of the sky but when you're a young lady dealing dealing with anxiety sometimes your head's not going to be logical in terms of uh the reaction so i i, I don't mind the exaggeration but you know some Sometimes it can it, it can be a little too much, I guess. They they can't you can go overboard with hyperbole. It's a comedy tool, but you can you can go a little much with it. Uh, mm-hmm. But it's, I don't know. I don't I don't. From my perspective, I don't think they've gone too far with their hyperbole. I've mostly gotten most of it. Uh, like again, because it goes into I can't relate to the ritual part, but I can relate to some of the weird beliefs around like masturbation and then like a family member dying and then think that you did it because of like the religious guilt around self set or self pleasure. Now we'll go into this. Growing up uh, in Texas, how was that conversation had in your home, if it was at all? Oh God! Uh, so my mom like sat my brother and I down. And we just watched a TV show. And it was this weird, I don't know where the fuck she found it. It was like this claymation thing. And um, The California oh Raisins about masturbation. <laughs> kind of. Like, I almost want to ask her because I would not fucking put it past my mother to still have this video. Um, because I know it was a VHS. So there's part of me that wants to ask her, like, she. I wonder if she'd remember the name of it. Oh no, <laughs> that might be a whole topic on its own. But was yeah, it was Kirk Cameron in it. No, 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 no. Oh. Um, my <laughs> mom, uh, I wouldn't. She actually, I, I never really considered her like hyper religious the way she raised us. You know, like I feel like she remembers being more Catholic than I remember her being Catholic. Like growing up. Um, but that's that's again, you know, something that. We didn't talk about like in this episode for Patreon, but you know how you can kind of convince yourself of, of pasts being different. Mm. Uh, but yeah, uh, but she wasn't really religious about it. I, I just kind of remember that being around like that idea because I, you talked about it. Like 
there was a little bit of us trying to talk to each other about his stuff to make sense. But some of it was also the shame. It was like, you better not do that because bad things will happen. But no, fortunately, that didn't come from my, my own family. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> my parents never had that conversation. Um, and, and because of that, I didn't start all that until 19, um, just because I didn't realize what would happen. <laughs> If that makes sense, I was too fucking lazy to put the time in. Um, <laughs> I mean, I more than made up for it, but you know, my parents didn't have that conversation. I do remember the conversation I had with my kids, and you know, just uh, being uncomfortable talking about it. And then the moment my daughter, the moment I'm done, my daughter turns to me and goes, "Do you masturbate?" And I'm like, "Shut up! Get out of here! <laughs> Don't ask me that." <laughs> Don't, don't, don't ask. Like, now we're going to talk about appropriate questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you don't want that image in your head ever. Um, here's some bleach. And, no. <laughs> but yeah, it's like, so some of the unhealthy ideas you can get around, like, there being some kind of punishment or repercussion for either masturbating or not doing a certain ritual before you do something. And then the anxiety is showing up. I, I totally understood that one. Um, yeah. <laughs> All right. Now let's bring up some negatives. What didn't catch your eye? Well, I did. Um, the brother's advice on fingering just kind of makes you shudder. Uh, especially yeah. the line like you've got to get elbow deep like it's a vending machine and your Cheetos didn't fall down so you really got to reach up there and then the booger comment was just too much um, the, the idea of, of yeah. leaving something intentionally in a vagina like at all let alone to be some sort of proof of whether or not she cheated because that's not how vaginas work just saying oh, um, <laughs> reminds me of all the all the stories you hear about, you know, guys, you know, do you, the, does she still have her hymen? She she must be a virgin because she has it. Just, anyway, go ahead. Yeah, but lots. We, like, that's a whole other topic, the whole, like, myths around the hymen and stuff like that. But, yeah. yeah. On the so, next one. <laughs> oh god like so the brothers just their advice was just uh, probably, like, I don't know. I, I've never asked a dude for advice on fingering, so I don't know what how close that is to how guys naturally think that's supposed to go. Um, Jay's brother punching him and Jay's response being it physical touch means you love me. I'm still not sure how comfortable I am about making his obviously abusive situation into a running joke on the show. Um, Without addressing it. Yeah. I mean, they, the, 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 I mean, it happens and I think, Art can be a wonderful way to show people the damage of what happens uh, when when this happens in real life, making it to where people, you know, hopefully put people in a spot to where if they do see it for real, uh, they can address it, but they have to address it. They have, because his parents are just evil. His, his brothers are scary evil. And, you know, Jay's a nice kid now, but... What happens after high school? What, you know, is he going to be encouraged to go to college if he doesn't go to college? You know, it's just so much bad could happen. And, yeah. and, and I do find it tough to, to your point, laugh when he has so much against him, you know? Yeah, I, it's where it's like, I, I guess it was kind of sillier in the beginning. But now as the show just keeps playing and they're almost harping on how like negligent and abusive his situation is mm -hmm. that it's, it's starting to get less funny for me in the show. So yeah, I, I'm not sure how much I want to encourage people thinking that that's a thing that's like funny. Yeah. I mean, cause I do agree with George Carlin that anything could potentially be funny, but you know, it has to be handled in the right way. And I think four seasons of, you know, making light of child abuse, you know, you, you, no, no, you got to do something yeah. at some point about this and something quick. Hopefully, hopefully that's something they address next season. Yeah, especially because, you know, they kind of did come close to doing something about it when he previously was staying with another family. And that's where it's like, OK, was that just too boring? We had to go back like to me, it is ultimately super confusing, like why he's still there. Um, but that's 
that's kind of all I had to say about about Jay and all of that. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I know a g- generic note I had about uh, negative. I, it's just some of the dialogue in the episode really felt off to me. Um, yeah. You know, it, 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 we kind of talked about it with the girls' conversation that, um, you know, they're hitting on some good overall points on the episode, but sometimes the characters talk in ways that I just don't realistically expect, you know, like kids to talk or, um, you know, or, uh, you know, certain adults to talk in, in certain uh, aspects. And it just, when, when the script was not firing for me, it, it really brought me out. And in yeah. this case, there were a number of scenes where the dialogue just, uh, you know, really took me out and I didn't care for it. Yeah, like, I, I would say the one that comes to mind for me is, like, Matthew and, like, the gaggle of dudes sitting around speculating and judging Devin's social media. Um, granted, I do think some of the mean comments they made are totally, like, based within realism like the grow up bitch it's just a hand job like just that kind of passive it's really easy to judge somebody that you know you're just watching them through their social media and granted you know <laughs> maybe Devin like going online hashtag Devin's privacy and like please let me have my privacy while I literally answer questions from just about everybody all day, um, all day. so yeah but does that mean that they deserve to be like kind of treated that way and I, I, I don't know. I, it just wasn't wasn't my favorite bit of it for sure. But it's a, when it comes to the Devin, I did I did make note about her presence in this episode. It really didn't serve anything, and they've never also it presented her in in a way to make me want to relate to her in any way, shape, or form. I I don't like her. You know, she's yeah. never really done anything uh, like even with Matthew. Like, I don't care for Matthew either, but there have been moments to where, his, you know, his humanity does come through a little bit. Um, Devin, on the other hand, has always been mean, always been nasty, always cares about just herself and how everything affects her. And, yes. you know, nothing's changed. Yes, that that very much is the case. Like, even going back to prior seasons where it's like they had moments where she was crying. I was like, have you ever thought about what it's like to be me? And then the stuff that came out of her mouth after that, like, there was no relatability. Like, and it was just, like, kind of, you know, a lot of unchecked narcissism about herself. Like, that whole that she she can't be wrong. Things are happening to her. Um, but yeah, I, I don't like Devin's character. I do actually feel like that is a statement that, um, or a statement you made that I don't necessarily agree with is that this does kind of continue a storyline because I do think the story of Devon and Missy, um, Oh, they kind did of briefly touch that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. this is still kind of growing some of that storyline that's going on that Devon is realizing like how much he's having to, you know, the whole code switching thing and like how Devin has this idea of how he needs to be like, there's even like the whole joke in the prior seasons of how his name was being said the wrong way. Like my name is Devon. And that's like the only thing that he seemed to get out of being out of changing and standing up for that was, yeah, he, he has his name said right now, but that took like a moment for him to stand up for. And yeah. And I liked that in the end, like he kind of got to be the mature one. And just say, hey, I'm just going to respond to this. That had nothing to do with why. Like, she can say that all she wants, but for me, that's not my truth. My truth is, I just think she's a, she's mean. She's a meanie bobini or whatever he called her. And just spoke his truth and said, like, and that's not why I would break up with anybody anyway. And you know what? If, if you want to hang out, send me the DMs. So I actually kind of appreciated seeing... Devon and how he ultimately wound up dealing with that like at the very end that was kind of like a little little last little nice thing I thought they threw in there and, and th- at the beginning of the episode I forgot to mention this in the, in the positive aspect but I, I think Missy's only real contribution to the episode was her reacting to the divorce but I, I loved how she was just a l- set up just a little too much, which tipped the hat to everybody that, you know, she had has feelings for Devon that, uh, you know, like I, uh, I, I forgot the specific words, but it was just something along the lines of I would never, you know, in a million years expect that th- this Devon person who did this, 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 you know, and, I, I like that little aspect that, that that they brought it out. I mean, overall, Missy is probably one of my favorite characters that they don't do as much with as they should. So, 
Yeah, but it seems like she's starting to grow into being more of a character. Um, like, they're really kind of developing her, it seems, this season. So I'm not going to be surprised if she doesn't come into more. Um, and we see that grow more. Uh, one of the other, like, just cringeworthy moments, as much as I thought spunk history was funny, it just, like, the whole idea of, like, getting drunk on your own jizz, just, just uh, uh, gag. And then the... <laughs> The the little side comment later is like, are these getting thicker? Ew. Drink I mean, water, Maury. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> I mean, one, did we need that? But two, I, I, it also led to a weird discussion between him and Matthew about, um, you know, you're, you're a gay man. You must know gay history and you must have all kinds of sex because of gay history. And... I, that doesn't ring real to me. I, I, it's like if it, yeah. I'll put it this way: if there is anybody in the audience that is a member of the gay community community that's listening to this, that has seen the episode and can tell me that it indeed is a type of conversation that people have with themselves, I want to hear it. It's just I it it didn't strike me because I don't one I don't see what a thirteen year old kid is really going to care about the history of anything unless it's something that really 100 percent uh, affects him and yeah you can say your sexual life it affects you but how does it really affect you at age 13 it, you know it, it affects you in different it, it it affects you i'm not saying it doesn't but it affects you in a much different way when you're an adult compared to a kid but um uh, anyway because yeah. anyway, while i thought it was neat to go through some of the facts of the persecution that like gays have been through in some of the history of it did i appreciate the overall message being that you owe them one to like jerk off your boyfriend no no i don't agree with that at all um <laughs> but Those i did people, like kind of covering some some topics and some names and some yeah and to be clear names. be clear i think it is important to know um you know you know especially gay history even if you are a heterosexual and whatnot but they fought for the freedom to live their lives as they want. And if that freedom means that a gay person wants to be celibate for a while, let them be celibate. That's what the freedom was fought for. You know, that uh, that's why we're living in the country we are now. There are people that didn't want to live under a king. So they came here and started something else. And, and yeah, it, it, that didn't strike me as, as realistic, that conversation with Maury and Matthew. I think that was just a way to get Matthew into, um, you know, actually creating something positive with Aiden. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I think really the last topic of this show, because we didn't talk about it in the positives. I'm sure there's some positives, but Jesse and Michelangelo is the story that this one ends with. Um, he is in ninth grade, so mystery solved on that. Uh, but what grade were these guys in again? Are they like? Well, I mean, she's Jesse's not too terribly off. She's thirteen, um, so seventh, eighth grade. So it's not a okay. big age difference between the two. Okay, yeah, because that's where I was like, okay, so cool. He's in ninth grade, so he's not like adult, adult. Yeah. But you do kind of get into that that these are the ages where the the sexual maturity like just because they're a few years together like doesn't necessarily mean it's an appropriate match. But I am relieved that it is like at least legal. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, because I mean there is a difference between like a fifty year old man and a twenty year old woman dating compared to a twenty two year old man and a thirteen year old dating. Yeah. <laughs> you know? that's um, usually not where it's so good. Yeah, no. Um, th- oh, I mean, I, I guess what what struck me about this uh, uh, as well, and I put it in the negative, but I, I did speak to the professor, and she's encountered that was the whole conversation about the blue balls. And I, to me, I didn't believe it because why would anybody believe that? <laughs> you know? But you have your hand raised. What I do. <laughs> yep. Nope. I've, I, I totally have gotten the blue ball guilt trip talk before. Um, and like, yeah, <laughs> that's a thing that I totally believed was like, oh, my God, it's causing so much pain. And you're like, um, oh, it's Nightingale. You're like, I'm going to help him. I'm going to be the greatest person ever. 
<laughs> yes, this is <laughs> going to be the equivalent of like washing oil off of penguins for sure. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I did love uh, Depression Kitty calling it like it happens. You know, let's depend on him for all of our self worth and happiness, <laughs> and just how those messages can just so outweigh. Um, you know, like even Connie, like every now and then she'd try to break through, you know, well, why can't he take care of it himself? Like she would have those moments of, of those brief little moments of where she would think clearly, but then either depression, Kitty or Anxito would tag team like they do. And yep. Um, we'll look at depression, Kitty, uh, throughout the past few episodes in terms of how she's dealt with Jesse. I, I, I love, this is a, it was that part I have to put in the positive. Um, what you just mentioned about, you know, Depression Kitty telling her you must rely upon this person for your happiness because that was a deliberate ratcheting up from where, you know, she began when she first came into Jesse's life. And that may seem extreme. That may not seem logical. But when, you know, I, I think a lot of people have been in Jesse's shoes before to where, you know, for whatever reason, you're just in self-doubt and you think I must be with this person or else. So uh, that was really well done what they did. Yes. And again, that goes back to I can relate hardcore to Jesse's character and like how well they depict um, anxiety and depression playing off of each other. Like even Anxito putting extra pressure on Jesse to make him happy. Um, and then Depression Kitty right there with the assist. Well, if you don't do it, somebody else will. Because those are the thoughts that talk you into doing things you don't necessarily want to do. Yeah. Um, and I loved Connie at the end. <laughs> like, why couldn't they have just done that the whole time? <laughs> or Jesse in her in her dream when the big doctor hand was there, and she's like, "You're a giant hand. Why can't you do anything?" <laughs> no, it must be you. Um, and another thing too, why does Michelangelo's penis need to sound like an intelligent coach, Steve? <laughs> you know? I don't know. I did love Jesse's very innocent reaction to the first time seeing a penis. I was like, because, <laughs> yes, I would have to say the first time you see one IRL, especially mm -hmm. like with no real education and all you'd seen was claymation versions and cartoon versions of things. <laughs> it is very interesting the first time you see one mm -hmm. because it's like, wow, that looks kind of different than I thought that it would. <laughs> And just how she wanted to, like, mess with it and, like, make it, like, pop back up. I don't know. I just thought it was funny. It And it was just so disappointing that he was just such a massive piece of shit about it. Because, of course, he was going to be. I don't think we expected him to turn around and be, like, a good person in this. Like, we just saw the younger children manage to do in other situations, which I felt was really interesting. And it goes to show, like, that whole, like, age does not equal maturity sometimes. Um, that, but yeah, yeah, that and you know, throughout, my, I mean, Michelangelo has not been a character that's been given that the audience has been given any reason to like, and you know, all of his interactions with Jesse have all been self-serving. It's all about how she could serve him in some way, and the moment she was not able to do it to his one hundred percent satisfaction, it's it's just like she was gone and. It happens, obviously, but certainly not fair to her. You definitely feel bad for her. And, you know, yeah. uh, you know, hopefully Michelangelo, if he were real, somewhere down the line would, you know, grow and evolve. But, you know, he's, yeah. you know, there are guys like that in the world, sadly enough. Yes, there are. And you know what? I would not be surprised if she doesn't get a random text from him someday. I'm just saying there's that level of uh, manipulation going on there where she's almost being groomed into something. So and there tends to be a hollow back that happens. So I'm curious how close they're going to stick to the theme of how sometimes people can be when they are trying to manipulate you and groom you into being for them, which right. I felt like that's what he was doing. So I'm wondering if he's actually going to be done done or if he comes back. Uh and then I think, like, the final thing, which I have a hard time saying it's bad. Was it my favorite thing? No. But was it an accurate depiction of what happens? Totally. And does it need to be talked about? Let's do that now. Um, the mom coming in swinging as if Jesse is just being some awful child. And this idea that kids just are bad because they're testing boundaries and not because there's something serious going on. Especially when she found out Jesse hadn't been to school for a week. 
And this is like right after moving her away from all of her friends and everything that's known to her. And as a parent, like it's kind of got to be embarrassing to not know that that's going on. And I think that's more what she was reacting out of was self perseverance, self perseverance. And, um, yeah, uh, then, then Jesse just like melting down into sobs and her mom just still leaving the room like that. Ah, uh, just gutting. I, but tale as old as time. Like the child is just being bad. I, yeah, I mean, uh, parents and I, I've, I, you know, I've been guilty of being in Jesse's, uh, Je- Jesse's mother's role. Um, every parent I think is going to be that because, it's, again, it's, you know what we talked about before. It's all about perception. Her, her mother, you know, is going through some major stuff herself. I mean, go, you know, exploring her sexuality for the first time, um, divorcing her husband, moving to uh, the big city uh, uh, from where they were going to be at, um, trying to establish a new job trying to you know live in a new place and whatnot so she just expects that her daughter who has been doing good throughout is gonna you know continue to just be good so when her daughter does ex- experience that i mean it, it's not right it's not it, it's not right at all uh, her mother's reaction but i get the mother's reaction because it's like her mother is trying to keep every uh, other you know spinning play on balance and the one that's faltering um you know it's just like she's like it shouldn't be faltering so I, I get it. It's not right, and that's a conversation that her and her, and her mother need to have, and you know, if they were real. Yeah. <laughs> Expectation setting is is a very important skill to master, and I don't think Shannon had realistic expectations. I think she thought everything was just going to be hunky-dory, and instead of checking in on her daughter, like, at all, she just kind of left it and gave it that benefit of the doubt that it was just going to be fine. I don't know. Something just tells me that it seems kind of common sense that once you've moved a kid away from all of their friends and half of who made them, that you may want to check in and make sure they're actually dealing with that okay and not just assume they're going to be fine. Kids go through enough. There's a lot of stress, especially in our public school system and with bullying and all of that. I don't know. It, it was it was a bummer, but it was realistic, so I got to give them that. Yeah. Overall in the episode, would you say it's good or bad? What is your verdict? Um, would you miss anything from the main storylines if you skipped it? No. Would you miss some really cool messages that I feel like they're trying to get to their demographic about, like, having mature conversations about sex and sexuality? Yeah, I think it's definitely worth watching for those themes. Um, yeah, hands down. The, the, and the fact that, like, adults can't manage these conversations (laughs) is, like, why I'm, like, yes please watch it. Don't skip this one. Like, because it might make you even realize something about yourself when it goes uh, to my general theme of like, don't be embarrassed if you realize like a bad habit or a thing that maybe you realize that you do that isn't the best. Like, because that's the point where you are totally allowed to try to like not do those things anymore. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Like, uh, I don't know, maybe you've talked yourself into believing that blue balls is a thing and you're just like trying to spread the word. And maybe this episode makes you realize that that's bullshit and you can just take care of it yourself. So just take care of it yourself going forward and, like, maybe send some apologies to some people if it's not going to be traumatic to them. But, um, like, yeah, yeah. I, definitely worth a watch. Yeah, uh, for me, I would say this episode is a mixed bag at best. Um, to your point, there are definitely some great things that happen in this episode. So uh, I would be very hesitant to say avoid it like I would the Nick Star because there are some good building blocks to what they're, um, you know, what what's going to happen later in this season and future seasons. But it's just scattershot. And more than anything, most of this episode just felt like filler. Um, it didn't feel like much was really being moved moved along to, um, you know, where I expected it. So I, I'm not going to go so far as to say it's bad because after we've watched Nick Star, we know what bad in this show can be. But it's 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 almost there. It's like it's like it's like they wanted to hit a grand slam, but we're lucky to get a double. You know, and a double's good. Yeah. Double in baseball is definitely good. But when you were looking to hit that grand slam and don't don't achieve your goal, um, you know that that says something. So, all right, next week on Patreon, we're going to be talking about episode eight of uh, Big Mouth. Here, we are almost wrapping up um, our talk on Big Mouth, and off the air, we will discuss on what we want to talk about next. But um, yeah, do you have any further words on this episode before we wrap it up? None. 
I'm I think done. I got it all out. <laughs> She's like, I'm hungry. I want to go. <laughs> yes, I smell soup. <laughs> all right. Well, let's get Tracy to her soup. So with that, we will see you folks next week. Um, remember, if you click on the show description and click on the link tree description there, you're going to be able to find out where we're at in terms of where you can listen to the show, where you can support us on Patreon, um, where you can uh, come to our Facebook group and join us. Uh, we definitely love uh, to see some more people there and some more activity. I do feel like there's the activity has slowly been building up in, in that group more and more. It seems like more and more people are interacting, which is really nice. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. I appreciate it because uh, I, I try to do my funny ha-has there because uh, too many people like to try to pick fights over stupid shit. And I don't want it happening on my wall. I'd rather happen in a group. So I will post all of my jokes in there. <laughs> there we go. There we go. So, all right. Um, yeah, again, with that, we will see you all next week. We Thank you for tuning in. Bye. <laughs> Say it like Matthew. Bye. Bye. Subscribe to Friends Talking Nerdy on iTunes, the Google Play Music Store, as well as Spotify. Remember to support Friends Talking Nerdy on Patreon. Goodbye, darling.